Welcome to Tune In Tuesday, the Four Witnesses of the Messiah, Chapter 2, Session 3B. Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. And the title of this session is The Theological Minefield, Part 1. <laughs> we are only partway through the minefield. But we're still safe. Because we've been following the map that the prophets drew. We still have to cover the differences between the phrases Kingdom of Heaven and Kingdom of God that are found in Matthew. But I'm saving that for chapter 3 in this class. However, we have recognized the crucial fact that the Kingdom of Heaven was only at hand. Impending. Around the corner. Possible. Available. If the right circumstances develop. But they did not happen. So... An unexpected time period intervened between the sufferings and the glory. A potential time period of which that caused Jesus to stop quoting Isaiah 61 in mid-sentence. Look at Luke chapter 4, verse 16. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. This is where I, Jesus is quoting Isaiah 61 verse 16 and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as his custom was he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read and there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah and when he had opened the book he found the place where it was written the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering the sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And all the eyes of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day... Is this scripture fulfilled in your ears? Well, why were all the congregation staring at him? Because he stopped reading. They were familiar with the scripture he was reading. Isaiah 61 was part of the liturgy that was read in all synagogues. And he stopped in mid-sentence. He did not read the last part of Isaiah 61, verse 2, which says, quote, And the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. Why did he stop? Well, he must have gotten guidance to not read further. Everything else in that prophecy was coming to pass, except the day of vengeance and the resurrection of the just, in which those who mourned shall be comforted. Certain spiritual conditions needed to be met before proceeding further. So, folks, the evidence keeps mounting. The opposers to dispensationalism may be able to point out an odd verse here or there which might be construed otherwise. But, in the light of the preponderance of evidence, when all the scriptures taken together, even those few scriptures are bulldozed into compliance by being forced to choose the options that fit with the majority. Now again, I regret the need to be picky or persistent about this stuff. But it's my duty to speak up. I mean, even our mommies told us that just because everybody else does something or believes something doesn't make it right. The Bible is our standard for truth. Not what theologians say about it. Those who preach the Word of God must handle it honorably and notably and, and bravely. They must let it interpret itself by utilizing the principles of biblical hermeneutics, how it speaks in the verse in the context or having been defined in prior usage. So, now let's return to where we left off in Matthew 3 for more unfinished business. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. 
I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, John said, but he that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will throughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So, now, we encounter another mind in the theological minefield. John the Baptist adopted water baptism, and it became the signature trait of his ministry. His ministry occurred in the last months of the law administration and in the beginning months of the Christ administration. Later, in the fourth administration, Jesus' ministry adopted John's baptism as well. Although, Jesus did not baptize converts, his apostles did. But here's where the controversy starts. Now, of course, for you in this class, I'm preaching to the choir. You already know what I'm talking about. But I have to think ahead of where this teaching might grow and So I need to cover the basics for those who may hear this on the playbacks. I don't know what their prior teaching will be. The fifth administration, the Age of Grace, started on the day of Pentecost in 28 AD. That's when the original Christian church started. Well, what baptism did they use? John the Baptist said that the Messiah was mightier or greater than he, and he would baptize in the Holy Spirit. Well, we read that in Matthew 3, well, Mark 1, 8, and Luke 3, 16, and John 1, 33, all say the same thing. And they pose that the baptism in the Spirit was something greater. Well, when did that start? Well, we believe that form of baptism started on the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit was poured out. That also fits with a dispensational milestone when the trace of the Holy Spirit given to believers could change. Jesus even instructed the apostles about this in Acts chapter 1. Now, I teach more about this in the One Baptism of Original Christianity class. But here's what Jesus said just before he ascended. Look at Acts chapter 1. Verse 5, Acts chapter 1, verse 5. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Well, we know that ten days later, on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit was poured out. But what does that say? Well, it sure looks like with the coming of the greater, the lesser ceases. Okay? But old traditions die hard, and many ministries have not followed suit. They still practice water baptism. Well, again, I don't blame them. They want to make sure that their adherents are becoming saved via the criteria they teach, via the rituals, including baptism, that they practice. That's a noble concern. I I don't blame them. Because I know they love God. They want to be right. They don't want to mislead anyone. They just want to get folks saved. Well, there also is disagreement regarding the method of water baptism. Does it require immersion or pouring or just sprinkling? Or does it require any water at all? And what about infant baptism? Does that suffice? Well, (laughs) I'm not going to try to make anyone change. I mean, we could take a look at the Greek syntax. We could determine what those nuances say. I could make an official pronouncement. And I could pound the podium. But there still will be some who won't accept the finding. They, they, they won't change. You know what? Wars have been fought over this. I would be a fool to try to force change. The only thing I can suggest is, what if there were a test to see if 
someone was indeed saved, man, we we could follow up after all the ceremonies and rituals that have been done and see who was really born again afterward. Well, you know what? There is that kind of test. It exists. There is a way to prove that someone has a spirit. You know, if they can work one of the nine manifestations of the Spirit that's listed in 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10, that would prove that they had the Spirit and that whatever ritual they had done to get saved worked. Any one of the nine would be sufficient evidence. However, there is one of the nine manifestations which was cited throughout the book of Acts as sufficient evidence of the Spirit and that was speaking in tongues. If a believer could speak in tongues, that was the proof they were born again and that they were saved. Like in Romans 8, the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. That's how it happens. So, speaking in tongues is proof. Someone is born again, that they're saved. They have the Spirit. And you know what? If that was good enough for the apostles then it's good enough for me. Now, let me tell you an interesting fact, all right? I used to be in a ministry that believed in speaking in tongues and that it was proof of being born again. I'm in a different ministry now, but we believe the same thing. Throughout all of those, I've been an instructor for many classes that teach about the manifestations of the Holy Spirit my Jesus Keys to Life foundational class and my Growing in God's Power intermediate class involve that very subject. And I have witnessed believers speaking in tongues thousands of times. And I can tell you this. I probably have witnessed believers speaking in tongues, proving they're born again, who originally came from hundreds of different churches who probably practiced all the different forms of water baptism or formula for salvation. And guess what? All of them spoke in tongues. So, what's that tell you? Their believing worked. Therefore, I am not going to berate them for having had a quote-unquote inferior form of baptism. I'm going to rejoice with them that they have the proof they're born again. I'm not going to step on that mine in the minefield. But there's one more fact that might upset the apple cart, and that is... Oh, all these thousands of people I've heard. I know of many believers who have spoken in tongues who never were water baptized. Oh, what does that signify? Oh, it indicates that maybe something different is actually what is required to become born again since the administrational change on the day of Pentecost. It's possible because dispensational milestones are times when such things can change. It is something that was inherent in the decisions the other people had to get water baptized earlier. Those believers who I'm speaking of who never got water baptized did do Romans 10.9. Look at Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Romans 10, verse 9. Romans 10, I write straight out of the Bible that if thou shalt confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Well, does that involve baptism does does that involve repentance or confessing sin or some ritual or some ceremony I don't read that in there but when people decided to get baptized they did so because they made Jesus Lord didn't they 
They did so because they believed he was raised from the dead, didn't they? Of course. So what got them born again? Romans 10, 9. I can even show a similar account in the book of Acts where believers spoke in tongues, which proved they were born again. But it occurred without them having been water baptized. Woo! Please turn to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. Peter was called to the house of Cornelius, who were Gentiles. An angel had arranged that meeting. And Peter began to preach to them. Look at Acts chapter 10, verse 34. And then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, he that reveres him and works righteousness is accepted with him. Now, Cornelius and his daughters and sons in his household were there listening with rapt attention to every word that Peter said because they knew an angel had arranged the meeting. And so when he said that every nation was accepted with him, well, how do you think it made them feel? Wow! This is available to us. Verse 36. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. What do you think they thought? Lord of all? All? Well, I want him for my Lord, too. Verse 37. That word I say you know, which was published throughout all Judea, and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And you, Cornelius, in your house, are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the alive and the dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever, whosoever, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sin. And Cornelius and his household said to themselves, Well, I'm a whosoever. I believe. I believe. And in the middle of Peter's preaching, something spontaneously happened. They responded to his preaching. They believed. Verse 44, While Peter yet spake, the Holy Spirit fell on all them which heard the word, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Had they done any ceremony? Had they done any ritual? Had they been water baptized? No. But they had done Romans 10, 9. Because Peter told them in verse 36, Jesus was Lord of all. And Peter told them in verse 40 and 41 about Jesus being raised from the dead. 
and that they were whosoever's in verse 43 well the invitation was given and they believed and became born again and they spoke in tongues and proved it did it require water baptism to make that happen no so something had changed on the day of Pentecost but old traditions die hard I'm, I'm sure that God had tried to get through to the apostles that things changed in the wind of Pentecost but it took a while to realize all the things that occurred and this was one of those instances that God was teaching them about what had changed because two things had changed they could preach to Gentiles. That had changed on the day of Pentecost, and they didn't realize it. And what else had changed? They didn't need water baptism. Peter was still holding on to the old traditions. That's, that's why he asked in the next verse. He asked for water baptism in the next verse. But the fact remains that the house of Cornelius got born again and proved it by speaking in tongues without having to get water baptized first. And you know what? If they could do it, then anyone could do it. I don't care how anyone tries to rationalize it. The fact remains they clearly did so before they were water baptized, even if that actually was done or not. Now, I've given the proof. I'll leave it up to you. I'm not going to step on that mine or fight about it. Because if someone wants to still utilize water baptism, I'm not going to stop them. I'm not going to raise a fuss and queer someone's salvation experience. That would be terrible. Okay? I want them to get born again. Whatever it takes. And if someone wants to still use water baptism, I'm not going to stop them. In fact, there might even be some circumstances that some type of ceremony like that may help someone turn the page. And we spoke of that in the one baptism of original Christianity class. I'm not going to object. Except... I will say that if anyone already has the proof that they speak in tongues that are saved, any further salvation ritual is superfluous and, and questionable. The fact that we believe that there were two denominations of original Christianity also gives us an advantage when trying to understand this topic. Because remember Galatians chapter 2, verse 7 through 9, it explained that God was effectual in both ministries. The Jewish Christian Church had Peter, James, and John as the leaders. And the Gentile Christian Church had Paul, Barnabas, and Timothy leading. And God was effectual in both. Well, we see from First Peter that water baptism still played a part significantly in the Jewish Christian Church. Well, why was that? Well, they were familiar with it. It didn't arise from nothing. It already was a part of the Jewish rites when John adopted it. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. Peter says, The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So Peter said that about baptism. But, on the other hand, water baptism did not resonate as much in the Gentile Christian church, as we can see from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Please look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 13. 1 Corinthians 1, 13. Paul says, Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? 
he says, I thank God I baptized none of you, but Crispus and Gaius. I got a note in my Bible that Crispus got soggy. But <laughs> anyway, lest any of you should say that I baptized in my own name, Paul said. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. Well, why was he so casual about that? Because they didn't use it in the Gentile Christian church. For Christ sent me not to baptize. Blasphemy! Oh, terrible! No. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. He actually said that. Well, we already saw with the House of Cornelius incident that it actually was not necessary for salvation. They clearly received the Spirit without it. So then, why did the Jewish Christian Church perpetuate its use of water baptism? Simple. It still resonated with the Jews whom they were evangelizing. Remember, Paul even used it for the ruler of the synagogue in Corinth. Water baptism. Now, meanwhile, it didn't mean much to the Gentile people. So in the Gentile Christian church, you can see why Acts 19 came about in Ephesus. Look at Acts 19. The great Christian order, Apollos, from Alexandria, only knew the baptism of John. So then, Aquila and Priscilla educated him regarding the way of God more perfectly, as Acts 18.26 says. And then in Acts 19.1, Paul, later on, arrived in Ephesus. Verse 1, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. And he found certain disciples and said to them, Have you received the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, What's that? We haven't so much as heard whether there be a Holy Spirit. Well, wow! What a statement! So, that proves two things. Did Apollos teach the Trinity? We haven't even heard there's a Holy Spirit. No. Did he teach baptism in the Spirit? No. All he knew was the baptism of John. Wow. Verse 3, And he said to them, Well, unto what then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. Here's the proof. It worked. And they spoke with tongues and prophesied. So, can you see? There was a different baptism beyond John's baptism. Well, there had always been more than one mentioned by John the Baptist from the very beginning. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all record John saying so. John baptized in water, but Jesus was coming to baptize in the Spirit. There were two baptisms. But then, why does Paul proclaim there's only one baptism? In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4 through 6. Remember? One God, one Lord, one Spirit, one baptism. So... If there's only one baptism, which one is it? Well, we can see which one in Acts 19. They spoke in tongues. For more information, I refer you to my One Baptism of Original Christianity class. We now return to Matthew 3 to diffuse further minds. There are some more things we need to talk about where we were in Matthew 3. So, back to Matthew 3, verse 11. 
John the Baptist said, I indeed baptize ye with water unto repentance, but he that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garter, but he shall burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Well, the baptism with the Holy Spirit is associated with fire. The word fire is used twice, verses 11 and 12. Well, are both usages the same or not? The first use is in a figure of speech called hendiades, H-E-N-D-I-A-D-Y-S. Now, whenever there's a figure of speech, I like to double check Bollinger's Figures of Speech book and get all the details straight. Bollinger says, Hendiades is two words employed, but only one thing or idea intended. One of the two words expresses the thing, and the other of synonymous or even different signification, not a second thing or idea, intensifies it by being changed, if a noun, into an adjective of the superlative degree, which is, by this means, made especially emphatic. Wow. Then what I do, to make sure I understand, I look at the examples that Bollinger gives to make sure I see it. So, in this figure, you have A and B, two nouns. And B, the second noun, becomes an adjective and is emphasized. So, for example, in First Chronicles 22.5, it has of fame and glory. That's Hendiades. And the literal of it is of glorious fame. The B term becomes an adjective. So, accordingly, the Hendiades in Matthew 3.11, he shall baptize you with the fiery Holy Spirit. Well, okay. What is it about Holy Spirit that is fiery? Well, you have to check the word fire to see. Do word study. And when you do that, we'll see that there's different uses of the word fire. For example, fire is uh, the normal process of combustion when things are burnt. All right? Also, there are occurrences of the word fire that are spiritual fire. And it's like Gehenna fire. And there's associated words in that context that tell us that this is spiritual fire. And one of the associated words is everlasting. Another one of the associated words is Gehenna. Another one of the associated words is unquenchable. So that's what that one is. Then there are some other occurrences that are metaphorical fire. It's something like fire that burns stuff up or purifies. So those are the three different kinds of fire. And in the Old Testament, fire was symbolic of a, something that purified. Sacrifices also were burnt with fire. They were vaporized. And consequently, fire symbolized the barrier between the physical realm and the spiritual realm. They got vaporized and entered the spiritual realm symbolically. See? So, nothing can enter the spiritual realm without being cleansed. So, what about the Holy Spirit? That's fiery. Well, I think that if we think through the seven traits of Holy Spirit... We will see what fits. So, conditional, fiery, nah. Portioned, fiery, nah. Exclusive, 
Fiery? No. Transformative. Fiery. Ah. Categorized. Fiery? Nah. Communicable. Fiery? Nope. Doesn't fit. Administrational. Fiery? Nope. So I say the only thing that fits fire with traits of the spirit is the transformative trait. Purified. See? I know that the more we manifest the spirit, the more fruit of the spirit we receive. That's transformative. They are the fruit. They are the results of the spirit. See? Galatians 5.16 says... This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. All right, well, the more you walk in the Spirit, the transformative trait is at work, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You see it? Receiving the Holy Spirit Today book says, quote, of this Hedeides, Quote, fire is the symbol of what the gift will do in the inner man. Unquote. So, this fire fits with the transformative category of the spirit. Now, the second use in the next verse, 12, is still in the future. And the actor in this case is not the spirit, but Jesus that will use fire. So, the use of the associated word unquenchable in that verse relegates the second use of the word fire to the judgment. So, that fits with 1 Corinthians 3. Look at 1 Corinthians 3. So, Matthew 3, 12, the use of fire fits with 1 Corinthians 3. Verse 10 According to the grace of God, which is given to me as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation, and another builds thereon. But ever let, let every man take heed how he builds thereon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day, the day of Christ, shall declare it. Because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will try every man's work of what sort it is. That's that spiritual fire. If any man's work abide, which he had built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. But if any man's work be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Also, First Peter 1 7. Look at First Peter. One seven, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found under praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So that's what the fire meant. It's a purifying factor, or it was the spiritual fire in the future at the judgment. Now, the next phrase that I want to cover from first uh, from uh, Matthew 3 11 and 12 is repentance now this may be a theological quagmire because of all the squabbling about baptism that's going on Matthew 3 11 said that John the Baptist baptized with water unto repentance. Now, that word unto is ace. E-I-S. Followed by the accusative. Now, ace is used in other occurrences with the word repentance as well. Now, ace can have many meanings. Okay, well, is it unto repentance as in purpose, i.e. baptism is a step toward the goal of repentance in order that they repent or is it causal ace, baptism because of their repentance 
Some translators even go as far as rendering ace as baptism is a token or symbol of one's repentance. Well, which one is it? Well, I avoid, I I, I advocate avoiding the quagmire altogether because I'm, I'm taking a pragmatic approach. <laughs> but <laughs> that might be as controversial as choosing one of those ace options. But since water baptism was made obsolete, I'm going to skip defining ace. Because <laughs> what benefit is there to know now? It's conceptual, theological, you know. And I'm practical. As you may have noticed, I eschew theological stuff. Uh-huh. I even jokingly call it the illogical. Uh, I, I just don't think it's profitable to engage in theological speculation. Some believe that baptism is the external manifestation or symbol of the internal reality that one has made Jesus their Lord. I, on the other hand, believe that speaking in tongues is an external manifestation of the internal reality that one is born again with the Spirit of God. What saves us now anyway? Romans 10.9 This is all part of the murkiness that surrounds the various rituals of salvation adopted by Christian denominations that set them apart from one another and that they squabble with each other about. Sorry, folks. I ain't going to step on that line. (laughs) But repentance is still very important. The Greek word for repent is metanoeo, and the noun is metanoia, repentance. There is another word translated repent, which is metamelomai. Now, whenever I run into synonyms, I like to check Thayer's lexicon, because Thayer often points out the differences between synonyms. And Thayer says, Metamelomai versus metanoeo. Quote, The distinction so often laid down between these words to the effect that the former, metamelomai, expresses merely an emotional change. The latter, metanoeo, a change of choice. The former has reference to the particulars, the latter to one's entire life. The former signifies nothing but regret, even though amounting to remorse. The latter, that a reversal of moral purpose known as repentance. Seems hardly to be sustained by the usage, but that metanoeo is the fuller and nobler term expressive of moral action and issues and is indicated not only by its derivation but by the greater frequency of its use, unquote. Now another source that I go to for synonyms is Richard Trench's Synonyms in the New Testament and he spends about four pages discussing the nuances of meaning between Metanoeo and metamelomai. Okay? But I think that 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8 through 11, is the clearest example of what constitutes repentance and the difference between those two words. Whenever you run into synonyms, try to find a scripture that uses both of them together then it's pretty easy to tell the difference between them. So, and that's what happens in this passage. So please look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8. Paul says, For though I made you sorry with a letter. Now, he's writing in 2 Corinthians, and he's talking about 1 Corinthians, because he was pretty direct with some of the things that they had screwed up. So, He says, For though I made you sorry with the letter, 1 Corinthians, I do not repent. Metamelomai. I'm not going to say I'm sorry and feel bad about it. Though I did repent 
I, I, you know, I, got, I felt about it a little bit about it emotionally, metamelamite. For I perceive that the same epistle has made you sorry, but for a season. Now I rejoice. Not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance, metanoia. For you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow works repentance, metanoia, to salvation. Not to be repented, metanoia, of, but the sorrow of the word works death. Now, what kind of salvation was he talking about? Because the Corinthians were already born again. But we have to understand salvation in its general term because sozo means to be made whole. And that's what salvation is. Okay? It's wholeness. There's different kinds of wholeness we're going to see. So, and he goes on to say, verse 11, For behold, this self same thing, that you sorrowed after a godly sort. And now he is going to describe the stages that they went through when they repented meta noeo. What carefulness it wrought in you. That's spude, diligence. So he reproved them. They were sorry. And then they responded in a healthy fashion. And step one, they decided they were going to be diligent to correct the error. What diligence it rotted you. Yay! What clearing of yourselves. That clearing of yourselves is making a defense. So, when they made a defense, what did they do? Did they say, oh, I'm going to die. I'm just so terrible. I'm no good. I'm never going to succeed. I'm such a bad Christian. No. They realized that grace is available if they confess their sin. And then they were cleansed from all unrighteousness. And so then if they condemned themselves, they made a defense. Well, Jesus died for my sin. That's what that happened. That's the next step. Yay, what indignation. They were peace that they got tricked. Yay, what reverence. That's reverence to God because they let him down. Oh, we're sorry. And what vehement desire. Longing to get it right. Yay, what zeal. What revenge? What what was the revenge against? The adversary for being tricked. And so when they repented, they got healed of it. They defeated it. They crushed it under their feet. They learned their lesson. They were bettered by it. That's what the goal is of reproof is it's not just that you get them off your back (laughs) no you do something about it why because you love God in all things you've approved yourself to be clear pure in this matter that's what repentance is People will continue to argue about salvation and water baptism rituals and confession of sin, etc. But I'm concerned with the results. And to be saved, sozo, means to be made whole in all ways. They sorrowed to repentance. Right? Okay? And it says that 
Godly sorrow works repentance to salvation. What kind of salvation? Wholeness. All right? And this wholeness is whole in all ways. There's physical wholeness, being healed physically. There's mental wholeness, having a sound mind. And there's spiritual wholeness, being born again, having Holy Spirit, and none of the other kind of spirit. (laughs) And all of that is salvation, wholeness. And I'm concerned with bringing deliverance to the captives and sight to the blind. I want them to get what they came for. Because God's word works. Because Jesus saves to the uttermost. Because when it's the darkest, the light shines the brightest. And you and I have the honor, joy, and privilege to reach out to the world with God's mercy and hand of deliverance to love and encourage and rescue and release people from the clutches of sin and destruction so they can repent. Go all the way through all the steps. We can and they can have a lot of the benefits that come with the earnest of the Spirit now and believe for physical healing now. Repentance then is in the mental wholeness category. Being whole, sound-minded. Because you know, folks, the valley of human need is full of lost folks who need help. And salvation is their ticket out of their problems. But is Christian salvation something from the outside in or the inside out? Do we clean up the outside and make it look good to get saved? Or do we get saved and the transformative power of the Holy Spirit changes us from within? Oh, wow. The miracle of all of all miracles is when the God that created the universe concentrates his power, artistry, and genius on us for that one moment and creates Holy Spirit within us when we get born again. And he creates a unique masterpiece that will shine forever. So I say, fan that flame. Get the full benefit. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven and be like the city on the hill, beckoning to all to rise with you and walk upon their high places. Glory to God. So, repent. Change your ways. Enjoy the glorious benefits. Be healed. That's something to think about salvation is not just spiritual one must act upon their salvation and believe to get the full benefits of what's possible now in this life and the ravages of sin and error have caused much damage in people's lives and to gain the full benefit of salvation they must change they must repent sin has consequences obedience has benefits That's what repentance involves. And it's not merely feeling bad for one's mistakes. It's making a change in one's behavior. Uh, But is that change merely to satisfy another party's judgmentalness? No. It's to defeat and conquer the temptations and momentum of sin and heal the damage that sin has caused. Some errors have a tendency to make it difficult to change. You know, as one gets deeper and deeper in sin, it's harder and harder to get out. Well, salvation breaks that cycle. And we're born again. And then change comes from the inside out. We renew our minds to what the Bible says and reckon our old man with all its tendencies to be dead. That is the transformative benefit of salvation. There's a lot of concepts that need to be understood properly to get the full benefit, but the purpose of salvation is not so people can continue sinning like before and, quote-unquote, just live off of grace. It's to change for the better so life can be enjoyable and glorious. 
But the catalyst for that change must be that person's own will. To get the greatest benefit, they must change because they want to, not because someone else forces them or guilts them into it. And this involves the proper church model for outreach. The common model is the condemnation and fear-based model. Oh, sin is bad. God hates sin. You are sinners. You must stop sinning to avoid hellfire. But there's another model. Not a conforming one, but a transforming one. The love and encouragement model. And when one becomes born again, they receive Holy Spirit and along with it. They get a holy calling, a ministry. And if we find out what our godly calling is and do it, there's nothing more fulfilling and healing than that. Sin, then, is an impediment to that. So the best reason we ought to better ourselves and not succumb to temptations is that we love God and revere Him and we don't want to let Him down because of all the wonderful things He's done for us and still can do. Because the path of the just is as a shining light that shines more and more unto the perfect day. Well, I say, shine. Shine. So a genuine, wholesome Christian is not fearfully consumed thinking about all the things they should not do but instead are busy doing all the things that they're created to do. And they do so because they want to, not because they have to. That is experiencing genuine repentance and claiming the full benefit of salvation and deliverance. Hallelujah, sock it to you. Finally, the last thing we will consider tonight for Matthew 3 is the phrase, to fulfill all righteousness. I spoke about this a bit in an earlier session. The term with that meaning of all, it involved the whole galaxy of the aspects of righteousness, all righteousness. And it involved the epitome of righteousness. The word fulfill is the associated term that brings in the idea of prophecy. It's a fulfillment of prophecy. Because the Messiah had to be righteous to do his work. Ever since Genesis 3 and the fall of man, God had taught that a substitutionary sacrifice could atone for sin. That was communicated in the skins that God made for Adam and Eve to cover them right away in Genesis 3. Now, I think the explanation of this is the best one is in the REV commentary. So I'm going to defer to the REV commentary. And they say the animal sacrifice, this is from Genesis 3. The animal sacrifice is the temporarily covered sin ultimately pointed to God's great act of mercy in commuting the death sentence and granting everlasting life to everyone who accepted the death of God's Son, Jesus Christ, in place of their own death. More evidence that at least part of the reason God killed the sheep was as a sacrifice to atone for sin is that the godly practice of sacrifice had to start somewhere. And the most likely place would be God's example in the Garden of Eden. We see by Genesis 4 that Abel brought a sacrifice to God from his flock. But what kind of sacrifice could an animal be at a time when people did not eat meat? it almost certainly would have been the kind of a burnt offering, which would have been burnt on the altar, like Leviticus 1, 5 through 9 says. It's hard to imagine that the practice of godly sacrifice could start any other way than God establishing the practice himself. After all, it would not seem logical 
that a sinful person could be made right in the eyes of God by killing an innocent animal, it's not logical that someone would think, I have sinned, but I can become right in God's eye by killing an animal. Well, how could the death of an innocent animal atone for sins of a human being? The idea of animal sacrifice to atone for human sin had to start with God. God would have known his long-term plan and that he would redeem humankind from sin by the death of a sinless human being. Thus, God would have seen the value of setting forth an example of how the death of one, an animal or sinless person, could atone for the sin of another person. And God made that example concrete by setting forth the practice of animal sacrifice. But no human would have known God's plan of redemption, and no human would have thought that death of an animal would atone for human sin, given the idea that sacrificing an animal to atone for human sin had to start with God is likely, but unstated, after that God sacrificed animals for Adam and Eve when they made skins, that they themselves even then presented offerings and sacrifices to God. That is where Cain and Abel would have learned about it. It's unlikely that God started the idea of a proper sacrifice with Cain and Abel, though, or that God had somehow personally, through an angel, taught them about sacrifice or the proper way to do it. The idea for a sacrifice that would atone for human sin via the death of a sinless Savior was already in the mind of God before Cain and Abel were born. And he started the idea when Adam and Eve sinned that they would have passed the idea down to their children, which would include Noah. The fact that Noah practiced animal sacrifice explains why almost every ancient culture practiced animal sacrifice. That is from the REV commentary. It's so logical. So, in keeping with this Savior who was coming to reverse the consequences of the sin of Adam and Eve. This was understood in that first prophecy in Genesis 3.15, where God said, I will put enmity between thee, the adversary, and the woman, and between thy seed, the adversary's seed, and her seed, the seed of the woman. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So this coming one who the, her seed that would do that would have to be without sin like Second Corinthians 5.21 says for he God hath made him Christ to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him because we traded places we get what Jesus deserved Jesus got what we deserved and he could do that because he had no sin of his own how could that happen with the seed of the woman which was human seed that would work but it was received through a different means than through a man God had to create it just like Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 says Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. For as much then as children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part, only a part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Well, what part did he take? He took the flesh part. The blood part was pure. And then because of that, verse 15 would work and deliver them through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage for verily he took not on him the nature of angels but he took on him the seed of Abraham wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make a reconciliation for the sins of the people for in that he himself hath suffered being tempted he's able to help them that are tempted 
This is what, quote-unquote, fulfilling all righteousness entails. Other prophecy was involved. Look at Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. We're almost done here. Surely he hath borne our griefs, in verse 4, and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, inflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's the prophecy that was fulfilled. And Romans fills in more details. Romans chapter 5, verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For Scarcely for a righteous man will one to die, but yet for adventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commanded his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed on all men, for all sin. For under the law, the sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned, after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and by the gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded to many. And it was not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses to justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more may which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one. The free gift came upon all men of the justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many will remain unrighteous, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. That is fulfilling all righteousness. There you have it, straight from the Word. I brought you to the starting line. One of the awesome voices of God had just been given when Jesus was baptized. That was the starting gun. Next week, we shall witness Jesus' first steps that were required to get that job, fulfilling all righteousness, to be done. And that first step was the temptation in the wilderness. So, folks... That's the light for tonight. Bless you.